All right, welcome back to Sports Exercise and Health Science. My name is Mr. Kabuski. Uh, we're still in the middle of Unit 1, which in this class, uh, for my Sports Exercise Health Science class, uh, is Part 6 in the IB scale. So today we're actually going to be covering 6.1, uh, which is all about statistical analysis and doing stuff with some numbers. Uh, basically, in this class, we're going to have to do some independent assessments. We're going to collect data uh, based on some fitness tests and some other things like that. And we need to be able to understand what the data is telling us and then manipulate it so we can get more information from it. So that's what this is going to be about uh, to kind of give you a heads up on exactly how we do that. Okay. So to start, let's say I collect some data. I plug it in Excel or numbers or whatever I may be using and I make it into a graph, nice little bar graph. Okay. And now if you're doing it correctly, the graph should have these things called error bars in it. And what this shows us is actually variability in a data set. So you can see there's two examples on the screen. I've got the blue data and the red data. Okay, well the blue data, I can look at those error bars and that tells me that there is a small amount of variability in the blue data because the error bar is very small as compared to the red data set which has a longer error bar. So that tells me that there's more variability in the data. Okay, now this is a Big thing uh, when you go to do your test, because if you would come across something like this, then you would know that your data, there's probably an outlier or there's probably something wrong with your test. Uh, maybe you collected data incorrectly, uh, something's not quite right. Because if I get an error bar that's huge, maybe even twice the size of my bar like you see in this cartoon right here, then I know there's something wrong with that data and something that can't be trusted. So that's another reason these error bars are really valuable because they're going to tell us how reliable those data are points exactly are. Okay, uh, Mean, obviously everybody should know mean by now. That's the average of a data set. Um, you can get that pretty easily using Excel or numbers or something like that. Uh, using the formula, if you're not familiar with that, you hit the, the FX, you put equals and then average and then highlight your whole data set and that'll give you the average of that data set. Okay, So you need to calculate mean with all the data that we collect Okay, and, and keep it organized. But you also need to calculate something called standard deviation. And what this is going to do, it's going to give us a value that corresponds to the amount of variation that we just saw in those error bars okay, or something similar for that set of data. Now the way standard deviation works, and there's a big complicated formula that we'll cover in class, but we're not going to go through it here. Um, but the way that it basically works is that we're going to have 68% of all of our data is going to fall within what we call one standard deviation. So what that means is, let's say I collect data on 100 people, okay, and it could be anything. Let's just say, you know, the 40-yard the dash time of 100 people. 68% of people are going to fall within one standard deviation, plus or minus, of whatever the mean ends up being. Okay, 68% of people are going to fall into that. That's how that's that's a set number. That's how standard deviation. Now, whatever that end number ends up being out there, where 68% of people fall, that is how I calculate standard deviation. That's what the number ends up being. Okay, and then 95% of people will fall within two standard deviations. So let me show you real quick what I mean by that. Okay, so let's say. I've got a set of data, okay? And again, when we're talking about people, we're going to talk in bell curve terms because that's what we call a normal distribution. You'll have most people in the average. That's why it's so much higher. And then you'll have a few that are like super fast or super slow, you know, or super tall, or super skinny, whatever it may be. You're going to have people on either end, but you're not going to have as many of them. So most people are going to fall near the mean, okay? So let's say I've got a mean of 100, okay? That's what I calculate my mean to be, okay? And then I calculate the standard deviation to be, at, let's say, 5. Okay, So standard deviation is 5. Okay, So for whatever this is I'm calculating, that means 68% of people are going to fall between what two numbers? Well, I subtract 5 from 100, so 95. Okay, and subtract or add 5 to 100, 105. So for whatever this is that I'm calculating, okay, between 95 and 105, that's where 68% of people are going to fall. If I go out to a second standard deviation, so that's 1, okay, so a second standard deviation in either direction, I would add another 5. So this would be 110, and this would be 90. So that would mean that 95% of people are going to fall within the range of 90 to 110 given this data set and this uh, set of data, okay? So the 95 and the 68 don't ever change. These are set in stone, and they are how these numbers are calculated. So these numbers determine that number up there, that standard deviation, okay? Uh, so you can see here is the kind of the range that would fall in, 34.1% on either side of the mean, 
that gives us our 68, and then you can see the 13.6. Um, so here's what that standard deviation is going to do for us. We should be able to look at one of those bell curves, or maybe even two bell curves, and be able to tell about the mean and about the variation in the data just based on the curve. For example, if you look here on the left, okay, if, this, if the number had a low standard deviation, so whatever I'm calculating has low standard deviation, that means that the bell curve is going to be very narrow, very narrow and probably very pointy at the top because that's more and more people being pushed into the middle. Whereas if I have a high amount of variability, okay, this number went from 5 to say maybe 25, now all of a sudden that skinny bell curve just widened out because more and more people have to fit within those ranges. Okay? So again, just looking at the bell curves themselves, I'm going to be able to tell about the variation in the data. Okay? So here's another quick example uh, that I kind of put together for you. If I can use the standard deviation to compare sets of data just looking at the numbers besides just the bell curves. Okay? I can see, okay, I've got two sets of data. Both have an average of 50, a mean of 50. The first one has a standard deviation of 15. Okay. The second one has a standard deviation of 2. Well, that tells me a big thing about number of the, the two sets of data. Number one has significantly more variability than number two. Now, they may be completely different sets of data. One may have to do with you know, the number of push-ups that somebody could do uh, in five minutes, you know, whereas the other one may have to do with the number of you know, jumping jacks they can do in 30 seconds or something like that, whatever it may be. I don't know. I'm just making it up. Okay? But I'm going to at least be able to tell the amount of variability in the data when I'm comparing the two. Okay? Another way to do that is using something called the coefficient of variance, and it's simply equal to the standard deviation divided by the mean. Whatever that number is, and it's going to be a range between 0 and 1, usually somewhere in that, uh, in that place, okay? Um, whatever that range is, I can compare that to other sets of data and see uh, what I end up getting. Okay? Now, most of the tests that we're going to do in this class, when we're, we're going to actually compare sets of data. We're going to see if there is a significant difference between the two. That's one of the ways we can do tests in this class. And that, we use a t-test to do that. And what it does is it's going to compare two sets of data to find out if there is something called a significant difference. Now there's always going to be differences in data, okay? That's that's pretty simple to understand. But what we want to want to know is is what's called statistically significant differences between the two. So you can see and I apologize for the crude illustration but basically, this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at these two bell curves from our two sets of data, and we're going to measure how much they overlap. And we're going to compare that overlapping and figure out if the probability of that being the case okay, is just a statistical anomaly or if there actually is a statistical significant difference. I apologize for that. Okay? So if they overlap a ton, okay, if there's an overlap of the two bell curves, it's hard to tell one from the other, that means there's not a significant difference. Okay? In fact, even this one in the middle where they overlap about half, there's still no significant difference. The only way that we would say there is a statistical significant difference is if they overlap less than 5%. Okay? And now that's important to note, we're only counting the 95% that people fall into. Anything outside that 95%, those two standard deviations, we're just going to ignore them. We call them outliers. Okay? They don't really count in our statistical analysis. So if less than 5% of my two bell curves cross over, meaning that the other one maybe crossed about that much, then we're going to say that there is a statistical significant difference. Okay. So the way we do that, we do a t-test. Again, I can show you how to do it in Excel in class. Uh, it's actually really easy to do. Just look up t-test. Uh, you need to know whether you're doing what type of t-test it is, paired, uh, independent, stuff like that. We'll talk about that more in class. Uh, but basically, the value that you're going to get is called the p or probability value. If your p value is less than 0.05 then we're going to say that we're going to reject the null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is always that there is a, uh, that there is a significant, or excuse me, there's not a significant difference, that something is not happening. Okay, so we're going to reject the null if it's less than 0.05, and we're going to accept the null if it is greater than 0.05. The null hypothesis is always the opposite of your actual hypothesis. So you may say, I believe that there is a statistical uh, significant difference between boys and girls in running the 40-yard dash. The null hypothesis would be the opposite. There is no significant difference between boys and girls in the 40-yard dash. So that's why this is important, because when we actually state our data and tell people what the data means, we want to use the phrase rejecting and accepting the null hypothesis, because then they can go back to our hypothesis and see exactly where that came from. Okay. All right, last thing. If I'm not doing a t-test, if I'm not comparing two sets of means to see if there's a difference, then it's probably a situation where I want to see if there's a correlation, to see if one thing is actually causing the other. Okay? It's called a positive correlation if 
one set of data increases and it causes the other one to increase too, we call that a positive correlation. And when you do the correlation test, okay, then your value for the correlate is going to be close to the number one. Okay, there, it's always going to be in a range of negative one to one. The closer it is to one, the more positive the correlation. Okay, and really we're only going to accept it as a real correlation if it's greater than like 0.7. Uh, anything less than that, there's different ranges. You know, you'd say like a medium strength uh, correlation, or if it's close to zero, we're going to say there's no correlation at all. On the opposite end, if the one data set increases and the other one goes down, that's called a negative correlation, and that would be equal to negative one. So the closer to negative one you are, uh, that's still a correlation. That is still significant, uh, but we just call that a negative correlation. Now, it's important to note, and this phrase you're going to hear a lot, not only in this class, but in other classes that you use, uh, take later on that have to do with numbers and data, uh, is that correlation does not necessarily equal causation. Okay? Just because I see both numbers rise, it doesn't mean that one is causing the other. There might be something else in between uh, that's actually making them do both go in that direction. So just because I see that one goes up and the other one goes up, I can say there's a correlation, but I cannot just assume that one caused the other, and that's important. Okay. Now, I know it's a lot of information, and it can get kind of complicated. Believe me, I'm not the best when it comes to statistics and, and this type of stuff, but I do the best I can. I hope you got something out of it. If you have more questions, please contact me. You can see my information on the side there. But otherwise, good luck, have a great day, and I hope this helped.